The Lutheran Hour, bringing Christ to the nations. God's words of grace offer more than good wishes. They have power to build us up. The gracious words of God actually change our lives and always for the better. These gracious words also tell us of the inheritance we have coming. Finally, these words remind us that we're part of a much larger family than we can imagine. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Dan Pavla. Later, Dr. Michael Ziegler joins us along with author and teacher Dr. Jeff Gibbs. All just ahead today here on the Lutheran Hour. Hi, this is Mark Eicher. Thanks for making the Lutheran Hour part of your week. And thank you for your faithful support. To learn how your gifts and prayers help in bringing Christ to the nations and the nations to the church, go to lutheranhour.org. The Rev. Dr. Dan Pavela is an author and professor of theology at Concordia University in Mequon, Wisconsin. Now here is Dr. Pavela with a message titled, Words of Grace Build Us Up. God's word for us today is Acts 20, 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paper greeting cards still work. We're talking today about the cards you put in an envelope and mail, or that you hand to someone, or that you put on top of a gift. I know that you can send greetings electronically, and social media has all sorts of ways to send messages and best wishes, but the traditional greeting card is still working. I read recently that the greeting card industry is around $7 billion a year in the United States. That's a lot of birthday cards and get well cards. All those cards do at least three things. They wish us well, of course, but they might also contain a gift besides just the words. And finally, they remind us of the people with whom we belong. Our text today does those three things and more. Paul speaks of the power of God's words of grace. The words of grace build us up, giving us more than just a wish. The gracious words of God actually change our lives and always for the better. These gracious words also tell us of the inheritance we have coming. Finally, these words remind us that we're part of a much larger family than we can imagine, the family of all who are sanctified by God's gracious words. These words of grace are not just a sincere wish, but they are the power of God to do His work. Let's go back, however, to greeting cards for a moment. I have a number of greeting cards propped up in front of me. I have a birthday card, a get well card, a congratulations on your wedding card, and a sympathy card. Our local grocery store loves me for buying all of these, though they're wondering why I needed so many of them all at once. But while they're all different, in essence, all these cards wish someone the best. We hope that someone has a wonderful birthday and a great year to come. We wish the wedding couple the very best on their marriage. We hope that the one who is in the hospital will get well soon and can come home. These are all wonderful wishes, and we mean them. We send the cards, and we hope for the best. But hope is the best we can do with a card. However, the words of God's grace can do so much more. God's word truly builds us up, as the Acts 20 text says. The word of grace is not just a sincere wish. Words of grace tell us the heart of God and his intentions toward us. Words of grace are God's verdict over each one of us. That gracious judgment is spoken of in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because God has chosen to deal with us by undeserved grace, we have a new peace and relationship with him. Romans 5, 1 and 2 describes this so well, saying, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. These words of grace change our hearing of all that God says. Imagine that all you've received in the mail lately are bills. There are the bills you expected and the bills you never imagined would find you. The debts just keep running on and you have no way to catch up. You hear the mail truck pull up and you know the mailman is filling your box again. Do you want to run down and get the mail as soon as he pulls away? No. You don't even want to know that he's come. And if you could, you just leave that mailbox unopened. 
But now suppose someone gets the mail anyway and brings it in for you. And he says, you've got mail again. Do you want it now? You say, no, you can just leave it there. I'll get to it sometime. But what if the one holding the mail said, I think you want to open this. This is not a bill. Really, you say? What else is there? Look, it's a card. This can't be a bill. Here, open it. See. And so you take it. And it is a card. It's not a bill. It's a card with the best news you could ever imagine. It says all your debts are paid. They're paid and they're gone. The future is paid for also. Any future charges that might come after you are paid already. You're free. You're paid for. You're out of debt. Now, is that news you want to hear? Is that news that could build you up? Absolutely. These are the words of grace that build us up. We lift up our eyes from the despair of debt over sin. We hear God's voice out of the darkness, and his call is to listen to his promise and believe his payments have come fully for us. This is the wonderful news of the words of grace that we are more than glad to hear. Forgiveness is the word of God that builds us up. Because of this message of grace, Paul can say in Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Hope is a fine thing. And joy is better than despair. But unless we have a reason for hope, our joy is an empty shell. But God's word of grace insists that God has paid our debts and has kept his promises for each one of us through the power and sacrifice of Jesus. Our joy is built on the firm words of grace. Our hope endures even in the midst of doubts within. We're built up with the words of grace. So we could stop here with the power of God's words of grace but there's still more to the message of God. It's a bit like getting birthday cards when you're eight years old. When I was a boy on the farm, a birthday meant lots of cards. I come from a big extended family with plenty of aunts and uncles, and so birthdays meant cake, candles, and cards. Now, by the time I was eight, I knew that some cards held more than a few kind words. An eight-year-old boy can feel if there's something else in that card. Now open it up, you'll find one of two things. There could be simple money in there. A $5 bill back then was a great gift. Or it could be a check, and that would always be something more. $10, even $20. Great, but it's a check. I have it, but I don't have it. It won't be money until Dad goes into town, goes to the bank, and cashes the check. Then I'd have the gift. That's Paul's next point in our text. Acts twenty thirty two, He writes, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The words of grace are wonderful in their message of forgiveness through God's mercy. But there's more than words of hope in the message of grace. There's God's promise of the inheritance to come. What is the inheritance he gives? It's the new life to come with Jesus' return and thereby the resurrection of the dead. All those who have died in faith will be raised, their bodies transformed to reflect his resurrected body. Listen to Paul's promise of this inheritance in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We start with the certainty of this inheritance of resurrection and eternal life. The news is wonderful. We will be raised from the dead, transformed from death to life. But can we trust this news that we still can't see in ourselves? We don't have renewed bodies. We're still living with our bodies that are so often weak and painful. How do we rejoice and hope with the promise of this inheritance? It's like getting that check in the birthday card. At eight years old, I couldn't drive from the farm into town. I couldn't walk into our bank or cash the check. But Dad could do that. The very next day when Dad was getting ready for going into town, you know I made sure to give him the check to cash. I'm sure I reminded him more than once to not forget the check. And my father never forgot. The promise was always kept. If our earthly fathers can keep a simple promise to cash a birthday check, Can we depend on our Heavenly Father to keep his promise of the inheritance of eternal life? Will he remember to raise us up to the places he's prepared for us? Absolutely yes. 
he will remember. And he's already given us the assurance of this inheritance. In the Ephesians 1 text, we read that he sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. God's good news of grace is not only words, but it's both a present gift and a guarantee of the inheritance to come. Knowing that we'll be anxious about our inheritance of eternal life, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a gift that is here and now. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the promise coming in the future, while also giving us his presence every day right now. When you got money for your birthday, did you get to spend it? How about a trip to McDonald's for two Big Macs and a small order of fries? That sounds great, but I'm guessing you got to do that once. The rest of that $20 went into some kind of savings, either at the bank or into that piggy bank that was almost impossible to empty out. You had the gift, but there wasn't much you could do with it in the piggy bank. God's gift of words of grace are more than an untouched treasure. The Spirit promises us the future resurrection, but He also dwells with us every day. The Spirit brings His fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the gifts that are here and growing today. Certainly in heaven we'll see the full measure of these gifts, but already the Spirit raises up these gifts now. The Spirit is a guarantee of the future resurrection and also the present living dwelling of God with us. He who lives within us now will complete his promise of a complete inheritance of resurrection to come. So, these words of grace build us up and also promise the coming inheritance. We certainly could stop here and ask for nothing more. However, there is one final stage to the words of grace. Listen again to our Acts 20, 32 text. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The inheritance comes with the whole company of all who believe and will receive the same. I wonder if only my mother did this with Christmas cards. I wish we could share our experiences of growing up, but here's my memory. When Christmas cards came to our house, my mother taped them onto the door frames of the house. She started with the three doors leading into the kitchen and branched over to the living room. Did your family do this? As a boy growing up, I thought everyone put Christmas cards on their door frames, but later I learned that we were a little unusual. The point of the cards was to brighten up the old farmhouse and also to remind us that we were part of a very large circle of family. I remember reading these cards and asking who this or that person was. My mother would say, oh, you know them. That's your cousin in Detroit. Whether I remember them or not, it was simpler at that point to agree that, of course, Alice and Herbert were the Detroit relatives. Those Christmas cards and words reminded me that, though our family was small, just my parents, me, and my sister, we were part of a really big, far-flung family. And that's the third message and effect of the words of God's grace. We are built up, receiving an inheritance, and doing so as part of the whole people of God. That larger family of God doesn't diminish our significance. The inheritance of the resurrection and eternal life is complete for every one of us included in his kingdom. Perhaps the best vision of this inheritance shared by a countless body is John's vision of heaven in Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. What a gathering, which means from every tribe and nation, means there is no barrier to any of us due to our heritage or inheritance. This gathering depends on one key. John asked who these in heaven were, and the joyful answer was this. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Our pasts have been washed away by his sacrificial blood, and that cleansing has come entirely by his actions of grace. Only his mercy covers us in his presence. But with that gracious mercy, we can come without fear, both into the family of God and onto his throne. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 expresses that freedom due to God's grace. Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, 
that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace brings us near to the one and same throne where every one of us receives the same gift of mercy in time of need. While our cards, and especially our Christmas letters, might tell the differences between us and our cousins in Detroit, the gracious words of God level out all our differences. In coming to his throne, we find the same mercy and the same welcome. Our paths are washed away, and only his mercy draws us together. These are the words of grace that build us up. Greeting cards are good, and I trust the greeting card industry will keep on doing just fine. But while cards can wish us well and might include cash and checks from our distant relatives, they're nothing compared to the words of God's grace. That grace truly builds us up by fulfilling God's wishes for us, giving us the lasting inheritance, and gathering us with all his saints. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of grace that you've spoken to the world through the work of your Son. Open our ears to hear your gracious words, to be built up, and reminded of the inheritance we will share with all your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes one uplifting message can change your whole day. Daily devotions from Lutheran Hour Ministries bring you a word of encouragement and a message to strengthen you in your faith each day. These gospel-centered messages are delivered directly to your email when you subscribe at lhm.org slash subscribe. Subscribe today, then share them with a friend. lhm.org slash subscribe. Joining us now, here's Lutheran Hour speaker, Dr. Michael Ziegler. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to Pastor Pavla for the message today. We're visiting again with Dr. Jeff Gibbs, a beloved Bible teacher in our church body. Welcome back, Jeff. Thanks, Mike. It's good to be here. We are nearing the end of our study on the book of Acts, and roughly a quarter of the book is devoted to Paul's trial, this, uh, this defense that he's giving in response to accusations that are brought to him and against him. How would you summarize the complaints about Paul that are being brought? What, what do his opponents think he uh, deserves to be on trial for? That, that's a good question, and the, there's probably more than one answer, but when you recall that arrest in chapter 21, it had to do with the temple and uh, the place of the temple in how God wants to save and protect his people. And uh, Paul believes, like all Christians, that uh, there's been something new that God has now done, that he sent his son. You could, there's like 50 Bible verses crowding into my head at this moment. <laughs> which one? Which one's yeah, going to? Yeah. Well, I was actually going to run to the to the uh, Gospel of John. 
Hmm. The word became flesh and tented among us. Hmm. So that now the temple is the presence of God to save and to give his gifts of life and forgiveness and wisdom and everything are in Jesus. You know, he, the temple was a great idea. It was God's idea, right? But now the fulfillment, that important New Testament word, that temple has been fulfilled in Jesus. But they didn't like idea, and they destroyed the temple. But in three days, he raised, he raised, see, there's God Easter. raised. <laughs> there's Easter. Him. There's the resurrection. So yeah. the resurrection is not only the proof that Jesus is the temple, but it is uh, his vindication, his priestly office. You can't, this is Hebrews now, you can't be a high priest if you're dead. You know, that's what Hebrews says. All those other high priests were prevented from continuing in office because they died. But Jesus' priestly office and intercession for us at God's right hand is because he has the power of an indestructible life. See? So they knew this, and so they're still focused on his opponents. are still focused on the temple. So if you just read Acts 21, you think, oh, they were just upset about this. They thought he had brought a Gentile into a place where Gentiles were not allowed to go. And that that was the immediate occasion for the riot and Paul's mm-hmm. arrest. But it was more about who's the temple, mm-hmm. see? Mm-hmm. And uh, who is, you could say it this way, the living house. I'm, mm-hmm. Now I'm running to First Peter, right? Living stones, see? So it's all wrapped up in what the resurrection of Jesus has not only demonstrated but accomplished. Mm-hmm. And then early on in Acts, as you know, in chapter 4, uh, they're really upset because they're proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, right? So that's their witnessing. That's their center of their message. So you could say that Paul is on trial because of what he thinks about the temple. That is to say, because of what he thinks about Jesus risen from the dead. Mm. And they don't get all that, but Paul gets it. And that's why he's been a, a riot. And now the Romans have him in protective custody. And then it takes off from there. Mm-hmm. So they have this trial. They have to move it to Caesarea because the riot in Jerusalem. And then it's like the the Jewish leaders get a get a lawyer yes. who, who can speak uh, to the Roman official, and and he lays out the Jewish charges that he's he's breaking the Jewish laws. And then he kind of throws in, and he's a he's a troublemaker and he's a disturber of the peace. And right. that's kind of the whole case right. that's brought to him. But then every time Paul gets a chance to defend himself, he always says it's something about the hope of Israel or right. the, on, uh, I'm on trial for the resurrection of the dead, which relates to exactly what you were saying. Exactly. The risen Jesus has given his spirit who's guiding and empowering and giving courage and leading Paul into places where he gets beat up. And, and uh, but yeah, that's, that's the hope. Paul always reverts back to that. And you see this in his letters. So the the temple, all the laws of Moses, these were holding or holding patterns or, or pointers to this greater hope of Correct. a person. The Lord God himself, the Messiah, was going to come in this person. And the resurrection proves that Jesus is that guy which displaces all those other things because the real, the one has arrived. Yes. And that's the, that's the issue. And I would even change just one word that you said. I, he doesn't displace them. He catches them up in himself, and mm-hmm. then in doing that, he transforms them, some of them more radically than others, Okay, right? Like the sacrificial system. We got a sacrifice now. It's one and done, and there are no more sacrifices of that kind anymore. Other things, the fulfillment, uh, to us at least, doesn't look like quite as radical a transformation. But yeah, someone said to me once that God never has a bad idea. He catches them all up in himself. And so the Sunday school answer, you know, it's Jesus is really right and profoundly true in in lots and lots of ways. And um, with Easter, something new has happened, right? Never before since Genesis 3 has death been destroyed permanently, but now it has. Hmm. We're living in the Easter time now. There's still faith required. There's still hiddenness. There's still struggle it's not all happy, clappy, but Jesus is raised, and by his Spirit, whom he poured out because he was raised from the dead, he's guiding and protecting his church as well. That's the story of Acts. Mm-hmm. Well, on that, not everything's happy, clappy. Yeah. <laughs> Every time Paul has a trial, the 
the officials always declare him innocent. Yeah, that's right. And yet it keeps on going on. So what what is driving this? Why does the trial just get drug on now for seven chapters? I think it's at least related to this that so Paul we know from Romans and we can kind of affix when Paul wrote the letter of Romans. He we knows he we know he was planning to go to Rome. Now he was going to go from there to Spain. That's what he says at the end of Romans in fifth, chapter 15. So, uh, and then Jesus appears to Paul after the trial business has started. He says, you're going to go to Rome, see. But if you read Acts, what Jesus could have said in that vision, but you have no idea how you're going to get there. And you don't actually know how it's going to turn out. But you know what? You're going to get to Rome and you're going to testify. And so at least part of the message there for us, if we want to apply this to ourselves, is that message. Jesus is Lord. Oh, you don't know what's going on? Jesus is Lord. (laughs) See, and you don't know how this is going to turn out? And, of course, Paul was given a dream twice, so he kind of knew, okay, somehow I'm getting Mm -hmm. to Rome, Mm -hmm. you know. But I just think it's part of that, uh, as you know, you emphasized this nicely a few weeks ago, Acts begins with, okay, the first gospel, that's what Jesus began to do. Now, guess what? Jesus is going to continue to do things, but he's the Lord he doesn't tell us, I guess we'll just have to trust him. Amen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You want to take up an offering? Now it's a little bit like a sermon. You're the Lutheran hour speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us in these conversations. And we'll have you back for one last one as we talk about that shipwreck and yeah. that chaos in which Jesus reigns in nonetheless. Indeed. Yeah. Sounds good. Now Dr. Pavela leads us in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. The Lutheran Hour is brought to you each week through the support of faithful listeners like you. To learn how you can support and extend the worldwide outreach of the Lutheran Hour, go to lutheranhour.org. This has been a presentation of Lutheran Hour Ministries.